Uh, the name of this session is The Need for a New Paradigm in Global Security, which, as Jonathan has spoken about, is we're terming it or human security. Uh, he also mentioned that I think we all agree that we are now facing existential crises in the world that cannot be uh, addressed effectively through incremental changes in our existing policies, institutions, uh, and, and ways of functioning. Uh, we had an interesting debate in the, the last session about do we need a fundamental change in human nature in order to grapple with the issues that we're facing. And I think probably if we ask the question, should we have a fundamental change in human nature, we'd probably have a consensus that that would be most helpful. Uh, but uh, I think in talking about a paradigm change, fundamental change in human nature is the last step in, in human transformations. I think we're a, we, there are a lot of things we can do before we talk about completely refashioning the human being. Uh, we've already seen radical changes in human behavior, in human functioning over the last few centuries. Uh, and uh, Evo talked about some of them yesterday and Jonathan, uh, a few of them today. So I'd just like to frame when we talk about a new paradigm, it is a very important, significant change, but I don't think we need to think that it's only possible if human nature is fundamentally changed. We've already seen that human behaviors can be substantially changed, human understanding, attitudes, opinions, and values, and we've gone through dramatic shifts in the last few centuries. So when we talk about a paradigm change, uh, I'd like to frame it in that sense. We certainly need, and I think there's a consensus on this, we need a fundamental change in policies. Uh, Jonathan referred to uh, uh, military expenditure, uh, the, to the two trillion we're spending on military uh, at the expense of investing it where it's needed. There's a global consensus today that we need change in policies about the way we manage resources, energy, biodiversity and the environment. I also think it's clear and there's a consensus that we need a fundamental change in our institutions. Uh, Jonathan mentioned the fact we, we have to move from a national centric, more competitive institutions to uh, a globally coordinated and integrated ways of governance to deal with issues that cannot be effectively addressed simply at the national level. And nuclear weapons is certainly one of them. No nation can solve the problem of nuclear threats unilaterally by itself. We've got to do this collectively at the global level. Uh, we also need some fundamental changes in education. And we had a very interesting presentation by Asim Kuryak about a transnational education. Uh, and it's something the academy has been focusing on very strongly, that our educational institutions are simply not in keeping up with the pace of change in the world uh, or reflecting the magnitude of the needs, the need for change in pedagogy and the need for change in content. We've got a fragmentation of disciplines, more than a thousand disciplines and subdisciplines, at a time when we're grappling with issues which are really interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. They're so interconnected with each other, more and more specialized knowledge is not going to address these uh, effectively. We know that our divisions between economics and politics and environment and society and human welfare and even psychology are really arbitrary divisions Life is not so conveniently divided. Uh, all of these issues are impinging on our life today and our problems today. We also need, if a new, we're talking about a new paradigm, a fundamental change in, in concepts, in theory. And we've heard a lot about that in economics. We can no longer just be going after growth. We can no longer be measuring our welfare and 
just in terms of per capita GDP, which is accompanied by widening inequalities and widening insecurities, let alone greater and greater unsustainability uh, in an economic point of view. So certainly if we're talking about a new paradigm, we have to be willing to challenge prevailing theory and concepts. And human security is about that. And even at a more fundamental level, we need a change in thinking. We have to overcome this artificial division of reality, this fragmentation, as if our human life and the world really exist in independent compartments that can be addressed separately from each other. We have to look at things in a much more holistic and organic way uh, than we have been doing up until now. We can't afford fragmented policies, fragmented institutions, each one trying to touch on uh, one part of the problem. And as we discussed in the question period yesterday, I think we also need to understand the limitations of our mind in uh, our mistaking our lack of imagination to a lack of possibilities. Uh, we because we don't we're much better at understanding what's happened in the past than foreseeing the magnitude of poss possible changes in the future. So I'm mentioning this just to put the rest of the context of a new paradigm. Uh, in place. We have seen paradigm change in, in the past. I mentioned yesterday the paradigm change after World War II, where within 15 years, the global paradigm of colonialism, uh, virtually uh, imperialist colonialism, political, military colonialism, just dissolved. Uh, and uh, uh, half the nations of the world were created uh, doubled in, in a 15 year period. Uh, we need a change from just the rights of nations and the, the rights of nations have been developing for centuries to now a focus on the rights of people, of individuals. And that was symbolized with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. But we know there's a long distance, I mean, that was a, a cardinal event, a landmark event in human history, where humanity as a whole, 193 countries, it was only 55 at that time, uh, but now have come agree, agree on a common set of values and rights that we have to focus on together. There is a change already, but we know there's a big difference between agreement in principle and agreement in actuality. So in this context, what we're trying to say is we also need a fundamental change in our concept of security. That the we're living in, we're still living in a competitive security paradigm where the more, the stronger one nation is relative to other nations, the greater its sense of security and the greater the insecurity of other nations. And even if, whether it's an individual security or the collective security, of a, a military alliance, the greater the security of those within the alliance, the greater the sense of insecurity of those who are left out of the alliance. So we need a change of thinking about even national security from a competitive to a cooperative, even a globally cooperative system. But at the same time, our argument is, and it's it's I say ours, but it's been the it's the it's the UN focus that started in 1994, but is now gaining much greater prominence today. We need a change and shift in emphasis from national security to human security. And that doesn't mean that we abandon uh, the uh, importance of protecting nation states and the, the, the legitimate rights and boundaries of nation states. We're not saying that at all. We need a complementary. We need a complement to national security, let's call it the common security of all nations, side by side, hand in hand with the security of people. And we have good reason for saying that we need this because we've seen that when the security of individuals is not addressed, the security of national boundaries doesn't protect us. 
if the threat doesn't come out from outside, it comes from inside. It comes by revolution. It comes by polarization of society. It comes from uh, increasing extremism, increasing discontent. It becomes insecurity of drug abuse or crime or violence uh, or corruption or, or something else. We have been focusing too narrowly on the national dimension, not giving enough to the global dimension, and at the same time, not giving enough to the individual human dimension. And that's what human security represents, the concept represents. Uh, it did start 25 years ago, but it came back again this year in February when the UNDP uh, presented a new report on new threats to human security in the Anthropocene, focusing on the seven areas that Jonathan briefly mentioned in his presentation, including the biosphere. Because though we're saying it's human security we seek, he made it very clear that without protecting the environment and protecting all life on Earth, there is no guarantee for human security. That's the foundation on which we exist. The human security, the shift to human security goes back to the discussion we had in the last session. It requires a change in values. It requires a change in values which started in 19 or much earlier, was affirmed by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, was reinforced by the SDGs, but has still not gained the prominence and priority that it requires. We talked, uh, uh, Miro talked about empathy, respect, trust, uh, resilience as critical values that we need. We do need that shift. Even with the human nature we have, we, are, we have shifted far in granting the rights uh, of people, the respect for people, and so forth, but we have to go further. The, the human security approach has several characteristics to it in addition to this, though. Uh, one is it looks at security as an integrated element. The SDGs are a marvelous uh, conception. Uh, as uh, Jeff Sachs said a few years ago, the, the 17 SDGs are really an embodiment or a manifestation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But in practice, the tendency has been to approach them individually as if there are 17 things we need to do. But it's quite clear that they're all interdependent with one another. The great clarity of it is if we don't stop war, we can't get the food security that we need. We see what war has done to food security, it, it, what it's done to economic security, what it's doing to employment, uh, what it's doing to, educa uh, to education and, and other things. All of these are interacting. And of course, with climate change, it threatens all areas of human security, all the dimensions, uh, and all of the SDGs as well because they're all interdependent with each other. So human security seeks, let's look at them as an integral whole is what we want. We don't just want them piecemeal statistics on carbon, carbon emissions is very important, uh, or food production. We need to think of how are we really impacting people? And of course, in different places in the world, people are living in different circumstances and their security needs may be different, but the insecurity, is higher today in many respects than it's been in the past. I think it's important also to think that human security is not just a goal, it's a process. The SDGs we tend to look at as a set of processes, but human security as a set of goals, but human security is really a process in which we educate, inform, and empower people to enhance their security. This is not something that can just be done on a top-down basis by governments. We have to be able to mobilize global society to work together, to understand that only by working together in a harmonious way, we can achieve the security of any of us or all the security needs of all of us. So empowerment of the, of the individual, empowerment of the community, is very critical. Empowerment of, or of the different stakeholder groups and in society. 
is very important. It's not just a set of goals that government can legislate or even pour money in. We have to get the whole of society involved in that. So in that sense, human security is a unifying approach, a unifying paradigm. It's like an umbrella that not only includes all the SDGs, but it also integrates them at the same time. And it's quite clear that there's no way that we can meet the human security needs without institutional change at the global level. We talked about it yesterday. It was a theme that uh, that came up uh, quite significantly. The multilateral institutions have been the single most powerful voice for trying to establish universal human rights and values and to put in place specialized institutions, whether it's for children, UNICEF, or for health, uh, WHO, or for food, FAO, or uh, World Food Program, whatever it is, uh, to enhance and our right, our, our focus on human rights and human security in different areas. But we know, and it came out yesterday, that our multilateral institutions are simply not sufficiently strong, sufficiently empowered to bring together humanity to work on addressing these issues at the global level, which, as Jonathan emphasized, is absolutely imperative because no nation state controls any of these, uh, even for its own people, without the cooperation and collaboration of others. And this, we just, in the academy, we had a, a program I mentioned briefly yesterday on global leadership in the 21st century with the United Nations in Geneva. And we emphasize the fact that how do we strengthen the multilateral institutions? One of our big problems is the power lies entirely with nation states and national governments, not with the people of the world. In fact, many people in the world don't understand how important the, the multilateral system is for their welfare and their security. Uh, we're going to have to educate the global public about the link between these institutions, which seem to be far removed from them, and their basic needs, their basic security. And that's also a key element of the human security concept. Uh, the World Academy of Art and Science on January 1st of next year is launching a global campaign in collaboration with the United Nations Trust Fund on Human Security to try to promote global understanding and education of how important a shift in paradigm thinking and action on security really is. Uh, one of the goals is to reach out to the general public to recognize not only that we're all in this together, as Jonathan was emphasizing, but we need the institutions at the global level. We need to put our support behind them, our faith and trust in them, if we're going to get the level of coordination and cooperation we need to do it effectively. But we also have to address decision makers. We have to, dis not only decision makers in government or in the international organizations or the diplomats, the parliamentarians, the business leaders, the leaders in technologies, the leaders in science, about because all of, in, in finance, and this campaign is trying to address all of them. Uh, we have a collaboration with the Interparliamentary Union, 170 plus national parliaments, which have recognized that human security is a key element that has to be introduced into their legislative agenda and influences their policy making. We also have collaboration with the Consumer Technology Association, which is the largest uh, technology organization in the world, the businesses leading top companies in the world that are developing the new technology. And they recognize and agree that we have to reorient technological evolution to more and more ensure that it effectively addresses human security and not just makes more money uh, for businesses uh, and generates more problems for us in future. We certainly need the cooperation and collaboration of the civil society organizations like Congo, the Confederation of the 
uh, large, and the religious uh, interfaith and religious organizations, as has been discussed earlier today, we need the involvement of youth. We need the involvement of the educational institutions. We need the involvement of the universities. It's not going to happen. This paradigm change is not going to happen simply because we talk at the national level or in the general assembly about the need for change. We've got to get the media involved. We've got to get the arts and the and cinema involved. Uh, we've got to get the social media involved in recognizing we're all in this together. So when we talk about a new paradigm, we obviously are talking about something very challenging. They have happened before. Uh, they are difficult to bring about, but they also tend to happen only when we're under extreme duress. And I think the existential crises that Jonathan talked about are, should be enough incentive for us to take this seriously enough to come together to make it happen.